when you think about the very early days of Linux, the start of the project, there is one name that is always going to come to mind. Linus Torvalds, the man who started everything. If I ask you for a second name, you're probably going to think of something like Richard Stallman, thanks to things like the GNU tooling. But there's one name that often doesn't get mentioned, even though he really should be. Without his work, Linux likely would have never actually been created. Let's go right back to the start, August 26th, 1991. And I really am happy that Google actually has an easily accessible archive of all of the Usenet stuff back in the day. There is a small handful of quotes I want to focus on here. I'd like any feedback on things people like slash dislike in Minix, as my OS resembles it somewhat. P.S. Yes, it's free of any Minix code, and it has a multi-threaded file system. And this was posted to comp.os.minix, the Minix Usenet. It is entirely reasonable to assume that if Minix just never existed, Linux never would have been created after it. Now, when Linus says, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU, he's not referring to just the GNU core utils. What he's referring to is the GNU herd kernel, which at this point had been in development, more like development hell, for a number of years at this point, and a lot of people at the time had very, very high hopes for what was coming out of the GNU project, and thought that that would be the basis for the free operating system that all of us would be running. I feel like the main reason that just never happened is because Linux basically did most of what GNU wanted, except it wasn't a microkernel. There is a chance, and some people have disagreed with me here, that if Linux never existed, and GNU Herd actually got made, and wasn't just this little thing that doesn't really have that many developers anymore, that all of us could just be GNU Herd users, and that would be the foundation of what we see in the FOSS world today. Now, the name I was referring to at the start of the video was the man behind Minix, the one and only Andrew S. Tannenbaum, and I have absolutely no idea how this didn't get any widespread coverage, but recently he was recognized by the Association for Computing Machinery in ACM recognizes innovators who solve real-world problems as the recipient of the 2023 ACM Software System Award because they give out the award for the prior year, six months after the following year starts, because, I don't know, that's the way they want to do it. Now, many of you may know the name Tannenbaum, although not from the most productive of discussions he's had. Linux was announced on August 26th, 1991. January 29th, 1992, Andrew Tannenbaum made this thread. Linux is obsolete. This thread has been seen countless times over the years, and has made a lot of people not really like the work that he's done because of it, but I don't think that's the takeaway you should have. In this thread, Tannenbaum argues that Linux being a monolithic kernel design, it's already outdated the day it started. The correct way to make a kernel now is a microkernel, and microkernels at the time were basically what all of the operating system professors were arguing is the correct way to make an operating system. Everything in the future is going to be a microkernel. Alongside this, he argued that Linux is not portable. It was made specifically for a set of hardware, and it's going to be a nightmare to get working anywhere else whereas Minix was designed to be portable from the day it started. And if you want to have a free operating system, you're probably better off waiting for what GNU is doing. Again, back in 1992, people thought that was actually going to happen. Now, don't forget, this was about six months after Linux started, after Linux was started as what Linus thought was going to be a hobby project that wouldn't become anything serious, but very quickly started becoming a thing that people really, really cared about. So, of course, 
he fired back explaining everything he thinks is wrong with the Minix design, which is very funny once again coming from a 23-year-old Linus who is now about six months into making a kernel. But regardless, this whole thread went down as one of the greatest arguments you will ever see regarding Linux. And spawned one of my favorite quotes from Linus. Linus, my first and hopefully last Flamefest Torvalds. Once again, 1992. And if you know how history went, you know for a fact it was certainly his first, but it was not his last. But I've covered the rest of this thread in depth in a prior video, so be sure to go check that one out as well. I want to focus on what Minix actually did for the computing world, not just this thread where he had a bit of an argument with Linus Torvalds, because Minix is a lot more than just this thread. Andrew S. Tannenbaum receives the ACM Software System Award for Minix, which influenced the teaching of operating system principles to multiple generations of students and contributed to the design of widely used operating systems, including Linux. Tannenbaum created Minix 1.0 in 1987 to accompany his textbook, Operating System Design and Implementation. Nowadays, this exists in a sea of operating systems development books, many of which I'm sure are fantastic, and I'm sure that some of them are even better written material. But at the time, it was one of the first of its kind, but having Minix and having this book be available made Unix-like development actually approachable and accessible to the average developer. No longer did you need to be a professor or work at some major company to get your foot in the door you could go and hack on an operating system and learn how to actually make something that is a Unix-like operating system. Minix was a small microkernel-based Unix operating system for the IBM PC, which was popular at the time. It was roughly 12,000 lines of code, which is tiny if you look at something like the Linux kernel today, which has countless pieces of hardware supported, but when you're just targeting one specific type of hardware, that's a lot easier to do. And in addition to the microkernel, included a memory manager, file system, and core Unix utility programs. It became free software in the year 2000. By targeting the IBM PC, which at the time, relative to PC prices of the time, was something that was actually affordable for students to buy. This made it so you could actually easily hack on something and you didn't have to necessarily be at a university. You could just learn how to do this yourself. For its time, Minix was an incredibly important teaching tool, and the work that Andrew did with operating systems design and implementation influenced countless people who later went on to work on things like Linux, which eventually became the main way we interact with Unix-like systems. Whilst Minix 1.0 and 2.0 were intended for educational purposes, when it came to Minix 3.0, this is intended for resource-limited and embedded computers and for applications requiring high reliability. This became a system that was intended to be deployed in actual production systems and has become the basis and has inspired operating systems that actually do exist out there and are still being used in production today. But the most notable use case of Minix in an embedded context is one that many of you probably are aware of the system, but you might not be aware of the usage of Minix. That being by Intel with its management engine, which you may just know as Intel ME. This is certainly not a new story, and all of this came to light back in 2017. Intel CPU on-chip management engine runs on Minix. The most widely used OS in the world is the least known. But the best part about this is Tannenbaum wasn't told about this, and he found out when everybody else did as he described in an open letter to Intel. 
Now, he was aware they probably had some sort of plan for it when several years ago, one of your engineering teams contacted me about some internal project and asked a large number of technical questions about Minix, which I was happy to answer. I got another clue when your engineers began asking me to make a number of changes to Minix. For example, making the memory footprint smaller and adding if defs around pieces of code so they could be statically disabled by setting flags in the main configuration file. This made it possible to reduce the memory footprint even more by selectively disabling a number of features not always needed, such as floating point support. Also a hint was the discussion about the license. I implicitly gathered that the fact that Minix uses the Berkeley license was very important. I have run across this before when companies have told me they hate the GPL because they are not keen on spending a lot of time, energy, and money modifying some piece of code only to be required to give it to their competitors for free. And I get that a lot of people don't like that perspective that a lot of companies have, but that is the perspective that they have. After that initial burst of activity, there was radio silence for a couple of years until I read in the media, see above, that a modified version of Minix was running on most x86 computers. The only thing that would have been nice is that after the project had been finished and the chip deployed, that someone from Intel would have told me just as a courtesy, that Minix was now probably the most widely used operating system in the world on x86 computers. That certainly wasn't required in any way, but I think it would have been polite to give me a heads up. That's all. Now with all that being said, Tannenbaum still wasn't a big fan of Intel ME. If I had suspected they might be building a spy engine, I certainly wouldn't have cooperated, even though all they wanted was reducing the memory footprint equals chip area for them. I think creating George Orwell's 1984 is an extremely bad idea, even if Orwell was off by about 30 years. Now, is Intel ME actually this bad? Really depends on who you're speaking to. Now, a lot of the online discourse got completely sidetracked, focusing on how he should have been using a GPL-style license because this would have stopped Intel from being able to deploy Minix in this way. But a company as big as Intel could obviously write its own OS if they had to. That wouldn't have really stopped anything. The reason why they use Minix is because it did most of what they needed, and then they could modify it to fit any of their final goals. But there was a bit of a problem with basing it off of Minix since we don't know exactly what changes they've made. I certainly hope Intel did thorough security hardening and testing before deploying the chip, since apparently an older version of Minix were used. Older versions were primarily for education and newer ones were for high availability. Military grade security was never a goal. Now, being Intel, they certainly have the engineering capacity to fix up any problems that do exist. Whether they did, well, we haven't seen any major ME vulnerabilities that I'm aware of yet. And as shown in the debate between Tannenbaum and Torvalds, Tannenbaum was also very, very heavily involved in pushing for microkernel design. And this wasn't just Tannenbaum, a lot of professors at the time were very heavily focused on microkernels, which never really caught on in desktop operating system design. Now, a lot of people do bring up things like the Windows NT kernel. NT is not a microkernel, it is a hybrid kernel. Some parts of it are monolithic, other parts of it are micro but it's not a microkernel. There is a lot of usage of microkernels in embedded systems and high uptime systems that really need to be stable, but at the time, people thought the entire computing industry was gonna be taken over by microkernels. But even though that didn't happen, Tannenbaum was still incredibly influential, and without the work he did, it's very likely that Linux just never would have been made. So, let me know your thoughts down below. Are you aware of the work that Tannenbaum had done? Have you maybe used Minix in the past? Have you read his books? I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon scribes and Libero pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me and... Good news is never going to be done.